training. Uh, but this morning, I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about uh, congenital hearing loss. I have to say that this was uh, one of the more interesting topics I found. There's a lot of literature on it, um, and reading certainly was interesting, partly because I'm probably pregnant. So anything that um, says anything to do with congenital kind of sparks my attention and certainly my uh, baby's attention. Um, but if we look at congenital hearing loss, um, in essence, we know that it's it's a, it really it's hearing loss that's present at birth, and it's there's this inability to convert mechanical vibrational energy to electrical energy um, that generates a nerve impulse. Um, today, we want to have a look a little bit at some neonatal screening. Um, we want to look at the classification of congenital hearing loss. We'll cover a couple of risk factors. We will discuss tests and investigations, um, and then we'll look at some management. And the papers that I've looked at are all very um, first, uh, first world country based. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of controversial things and good discussion points, but that's also good for an academic meeting. So if we look at congenital hearing loss, and specifically, if you were in one of these countries, so that's North America, or you were in Europe, you'd probably have a really well-developed neonatal hearing screening program. Now, that might not be so in your country and, and probably not in South Africa. Um, but if you were in one of these first world countries, um, you would get your neonatal screening. And uh, when would this happen? It would happen in baby's first month of life. And you would identify the problem that there's a hearing loss. And this early pickup would result in really early intervention and subsequent treatment. And what would that mean for you? Well, it would mean that you would have better development in childhood and all even life. So hooray. So on the background of this, this development in childhood, a lot of the studies have proven that neonatal screening is an excellent idea. And in contrast to what they were doing before, uh, the literature actually now recommends that we do universal neonatal hearing screening. And what does that mean? Well, that means that we should actually be screening all newborns, not only the at-risk patients as previously were screened for. Now, screening is not without its problems, and you can have some drawbacks, um, like, for example, you might have a normal screening at birth, um, but it may miss progressive hearing loss causes if it was only a snapshot in time. And this then means that you obviously need to repeat screening in patients that are at risk for congenital hearing loss. So we know that screening is a great idea. But in our context, and certainly in other contexts, um, with quite significant resource constraints, we have to start thinking about what would this actually cost. So if we look at the literature, um, if we look at epidemiolo epidemiologically, um, countries that have universal screening programs, for example, as we mentioned, North America and Europe, in these countries with great screening programs, their prevalence for permanent bilateral hearing loss is around one in a thousand live births. And this increases as kidneys get older. So when they reach primary school age, you're looking at almost three in a thousand. And then your adolescent group, you're looking at about three and a half um, per thousand adolescents. Now, the increase that we see here is most likely due to the cumulative nature. In, in other words, there are some forms of hearing loss that will be progressive or acquired during life, um, or even some of our genetic conditions can also have late onset of hearing loss. But if we looked in sub-Saharan Africa um, at our screening, um, universal screening programs, which I'm pretty sure a lot of countries um, don't have great screening programs in place, the prevalence jumps up quite significantly. So there we're looking at around 19 per 1,000 people <coughs> in Sub-Saharan Africa and about 25 in Southeast Asia. So when they looked at the differences between what the most important predictors were between these high and low income countries, you would think that it would be predominantly weighted. The big differences would be because of different methods of diagnosis or criteria for hearing loss, but actually, that was the second, the second sort of uh, predictor. The most important predictor, the biggest difference between high and low income countries with regards to congenital hearing loss is actually the risk factor profile that's different between the two countries. So if we're gonna look at congenital hearing loss and if we're gonna do a bit of a mental cost assessment, we wanna know how big or bad is the problem of congenital hearing loss. As quoted before, 
In sub-Saharan Africa, we're looking at about 19 per 1,000 newborns. So to quantify this, I had to think of, a, of an example. And I went to a fairly large high school of around 1,100 children, and our classes were all sort of about 25 children strong. So perhaps if you look at the image on the right, if you imagine this whole group of kids out of a high school in terms of number, that's an entire classroom um, out of a fairly standard high school that might have congenital hearing loss. The other thing we have to think about when we talk about how bad or big the problem is, is really how does it affect our kid, children's lives? Well, we know with no early intervention, basic things like reading skills fall behind. This significantly impairs, um, creates an impairment in your socioeconomic <clears throat> development, gives you pretty average academic performance, and thus it can actually limit your employment options. So you can see that it actually causes quite a vicious cycle if it's not addressed early. When we look at speech, we know that um, it affects children's quality of life by significantly impairing their speech. We know that congenital hearing loss, if it's identified by six months of age, these kiddies that are picked up by six months have significantly better speech and language skills versus those that are identified later on or where there's a, de a delay in identification. So actually, international trends suggest that hearing aids should be offered to kids before six months. This is now becoming a standard goal in children with bilateral congenital hearing loss. Why do you think there might be some delays um, at the age of diagnosis? Well, they've done quite a few studies on this, and I'm sure that this changes with regards to where you stay. But some of the suggestions that um, have been proposed in the literature are that sometimes Parents require, request time to think about the hearing loss. It's obviously quite a big diagnosis and there's then subsequently a couple of months delay with, before the parents actually come back and make a decision on what they would like to do or what options are offered to them. There could be cultural barriers if you think of interventions like the wearing of hearing aids that might not be common practice within your cultural context. Often um, parents don't, parents or grandmothers don't really want to accept um, additional um, assistive devices like hearing aids. A lot of our patients have transport issues. So if you have a parent who's trying to process what the information that you've given them and they decided they might want to come back in a month, um, if they have a transport issue, that time is immediately prolonged. Some patients might have doubts or denial about how bad the child's hearing loss actually is. Or they're not too sure about different amplification options, such as hearing aids or even, the, even broaching the suggestion of a cochlear implant. <coughs> so what does neonatal screening cost? Well, there is a lot of increasing evidence that it's actually comparable to other newborn screening programs. And not only is it extremely beneficial to the child's development and quality of life, but the feeling is that the benefits actually outweigh the long-term costs. Now, given that it would, be, it would cost a fair amount um, for every country to be able to jumpstart a neonatal screening program, but the evidence is definitely out that long -term, the long-term cost of not having a neonatal screening program uh, far outweigh the initial costs um, that would need to be injected in order to get it going. So there has been a change in thinking. One of the big changes in thinking with regards to screening is We've gone from doing target screening of at-risk babies to suggesting universal screening programs, meaning that we shouldn't be screening only children at risk. Actually, we should be screening all children. Um, and this is because early detection is beneficial to child development. So what does screening typically look like? Well, most screening, um, most screening programs have two phases, and this can consist of a combination of different tests. So either they would have um, two autoacoustic emission measurements or two um, auditory um, brainstem responses or a combination of autoacoustic emissions and an auditory brainstem response. If they fail the screening, they need to be immediately referred for audiological and medical evaluation. And this should really happen before the child is even three months of age. As mentioned before, passing your screening on either of these two phases will not exclude any progressive or late onset hearing losses, and it may not pick up the less severe hearing losses at around 30 to 40 dBs. So what this says to you is trust the concerned parent 
a parent with a child that has passed their initial neonatal screening but is concerned about language or hearing in their child, you should trust them. Things may have changed. And the second point is that we need to follow up children that are that already have hearing loss risk factors as they go through their lives. What are the risk factors for congenital hearing loss? Now, this is quite a nice table from the American Academy of Pediatrics. There's a joint committee on infant hearing um, that set up this risk factors, um, and it's specifically for congenital or late onset hearing loss. Some of the risk factors we've mentioned, speech or language and developmental delay, the family history of hearing loss, um, and then interestingly enough, which we'll elaborate on is actually neonatal intensive care stay for longer than five days. Some literature says longer, longer than 12 days. In utero infections is probably one that's fairly well known. Uh, we often talk about our torture screen. Craniofacial abnormalities, which we can often get a clue when we examine our children, such as ear tags or ear pits. Any syndromic physical findings. Um, neurodegenerative disorders, if a child had meningitis, head trauma, and obviously other things such as chemotherapy. With regards to the neonatal ICU admission, what I found quite interesting was that there's a much greater prevalence of hearing loss in children that were admitted to neonatal ICU as their gestational age decreases. In other words, the younger, more premature babies had a much higher prevalence of hearing loss. As their birth weight decreased, so the smaller babies also tended to have a greater prevalence. And then also our medical interventions, for example, ventilation, and perhaps a child requires antibiotics such as aminoglycosides. If they were admitted for more than 12 days, and also if there's any history of high frequency ventilation. So perhaps when we're seeing these patients preoperatively or in our clinic, sorry, not preoperatively, but if we're seeing them in our clinic, you know, we should, sometimes we just sort of ask whether or not how your birth history was and was it all okay, but we don't actually get into the nitty gritty of, you know, what kind of medical interventions they actually had whilst they were in ICU, as all of these things actually puts the children at risk. Sure, you could argue that these children are often prim and that there might just be a delayed maturation of the auditory system, but in the literature it definitely seems to, to suggest that our medical interventions, prolonged hospital stay, and certainly high frequency ventilation does certainly play a role. So there are many other causes of hearing loss and our interventions we need to direct according to the etiology and the type of hearing loss. By far the most common hearing loss in, in terms of congenital hearing loss are due to genetic factors and most often it's not multiple genes that are involved, it's often single gene defects. But these gene defects can have different inheritance modes and prevalences. So if we look at genetic congenital hearing loss, broadly it's divided into non-syndromic and syndromic. So obviously non-syndromic, hearing loss is your only feature. There's no other in co-inherited physical findings. Syndromic, there are many. Um, Usher and Gerbil and Long and Nielsen is only two mentions of a great host of syndromic ones. And these are really the kids that have hearing loss and they have other co-inherited physical or laboratory findings. The other um, causes of hearing loss um, are your craniofacial abnormalities and congenital infections. So those are the three big groups. When we look at congenital um, genetic non-syndromic hearing loss, these children often have very severe to profound hearing loss. And most frequently, the problem, the genetic problem, is the gap junction protein um, mutation of beta 2 G or GBB2, which we'll look at a little bit later. Often these have an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern, but it can also be autosomal dominant or even X linked. Um, I found uh, in the website on the left corner that I posted. If you are interested, there is a great website which will actually list all hearing loss associated genes that you can go onto and it's regularly updated. So that's hereditaryhearingloss.org. If we look at genetic congenital syndromic hearing loss, so these are kiddies that have other syndromes associated with their hearing loss, our clinical exams could also give us a clue to what the syndromic causes. These might be things like a widened nasal bridge, some pigmentation abnormalities, preauricular pits or tags, or branchial cysts. 
There are more than 400 syndromes described, despite the fact that often in ENT we have our, we certainly have our favorites that we like to know well, but it is to be aware that there are actually more than 400 syndromes. Um, all the gene, certain genes are associated with a particular syndrome, and there is now fairly great um, genetic testing available if you wanted to look in um, and be able to really nail down which syndrome you think that this patient has. Um, if we look at genetic congenital hearing loss, often we have problems in two areas um, of the ear, the inner ear. Um, predominantly, it's the stria vascularis, and the second area that, the, um, that is infected, uh, affected, is um, the stereo cilia. <laughs> So the image on the right might be a bit busy, but it was the best image I could find just to illustrate the stria vascularis. So in the inner ear, you have the stria vascularis. The stria vascularis, I hope my pointer shows, is this bit over here. This stria vascularis produces endolymph, and the endolymph then comes and it coats your hair cells, and that helps for auditory transduction. It creates an endolymph environment with a high potassium and a low sodium. And the stria vascularis also consists of three cells. So it consists of your marginal cells, your intermediate cells, and your basal cells. And these three sets of cells talk to each other via gap junctions. Now, gap junctions are coded for by proteins. And these proteins are, as we mentioned before, uh, gap junction beta 2 and gap junction beta 6, as well as many others. But by far the most common um, genes involved are GJB2 and GJB6. There is allowance for ion transport and electrical coupling through these gap junctions. So when you have a mutation in that specific gene, it, can, it creates the most common cause of severe to profound autosomal recessive congenital hearing loss in many populations. And this is actually a non-syndromic form of hearing loss. The intermediate cell layer is also separated from the marginal layer. So these two layers are separated. <clears throat> and they are separated by two really tight junction barriers, which help to limit passive ion movement. And the junctions are made by claudins and by other um, domain-containing proteins, as mentioned there. So any mutations in any of these claudins or these mar marvel domain-containing proteins can also result in autosomal recessive non-syndromic hearing loss. So <clears throat> it's not only the gap junction um, proteins, it can also be um, genetic mutations in other areas of the stria vascularis. So as we mentioned, mentioned mutations in other areas affecting the endolymph factor ion, uh, ionic hemostasis can also result in non-syndromic forms of hearing loss. That's just one other example. And even sometimes it can form syndromic forms of hearing loss. The examples here would be E syndrome or Barter syndrome. Mutations in genes coding for iron transport and pumps and iron composition might result in Pendred syndrome, which is hearing loss and goiter formation, or even distal renal tubular acidosis with deafness. Okay. The second group that we want to look at is our congenital hearing loss that are acquired. And here we're really talking about infections. <clears throat> There's a very extensive table um, covering most of our tortures, which we generally screen for. Um, we will only be going into depth uh, uh, with regards to two viruses, really, um, specifically rubella and cytomegalo. But as you see, and I'm sure as you know, there are many others. Um, toxoplasmosis, herpes simplex. This is a very useful table, which you can have a look at um, you know, if you would like to refer back to this, that just sort of gives an indication of the transmission, how common the congenital infection is, what you might see early, what you might see late, and how you can diagnose it in a newborn um, postnatally. In other words, which test you might be able to do. For the sake of the presentation, I haven't gone into too much detail in all of these. Um, I think we would be here until tomorrow. Um, with regards to the infectious agents, um, this table is also a really nice table that can give you an indication of how severe this might be, what the progression might be, what the treatment would be for every individual infectious congenital hearing loss um, virus or, or infection. 
And this might be quite useful if you wanted to print this. This might be quite useful in terms of counseling your parents um, and letting them know, you know what to expect and what the treatment options are if you don't remember this um, offhand. So if we look a little bit at some uh, specific congenital infections, uh, the first one we want to have a look at is Sartomegla virus. So that's the big blue virus in the image over there. So CMV is certainly the most common non-genetic cause of sensory neural hearing loss. And in developing countries like ours, it's probably around, the prevalence is probably around one to 6%. In developed countries, the prevalence is far lower. Um, this virus is generally shared in bodily fluids, so saliva, urine, blood, and this can, you can be exposed to this by contact with bodily fluids with young children. So maybe giving um, young children big sloppy kisses if they've had cytomegalovirus um, <laughs> is not the best idea. Um, and it, you can also pick it up via sexual contact. Once an individual is infected with cytomegalovirus, this viral shedding occurs for months and shedding as we mentioned is in bodily fluids this puts other pregnant women like myself at quite an extensive um, exposure risk congenital cytomegalovirus risk is certainly highest after there's primary infection during pregnancy with a very high rate at this point of vertical transmission of around 32 percent However, in seropositive mothers, where there's reactivation and reinfection of cytomegalovirus, virus, the vertical transmission is much lower. It's only around 1%. How does cytomegalovirus virus cause pathology? We're not really sure. We think that there might be a cytomolytic effect of the viral infection. There might be a bit of immune injury, and there might be some, mediate, some mediated host immune responses. The virulence of the virus and the immune responses of the mother, the fetus, and the placenta play a really crucial role in the outcome of this infection. But the, up to around 10% of cytomegalovirus infected newborns are symptomatic at birth. So that means that you've got a whopping 90% of cytomegalovirus infected newborns that are born that have absolutely no symptoms. The next one we want to have a look at is we want to have a look at congenital rubella. So infants born with congenital rubella are usually termed if they might have slightly lower birth weights. Um, the most common complication of rubella infection is hearing loss. Others are heart defects and cataracts. And this combination of hearing loss, heart defects and cataracts is the classic type of congenital rubella. There might be other things such as hepatosplenomegaly or microcephaly. Again, the mechanism of hearing loss is not fully explained. It might be direct cochlear damages, changes in the infant in the limb or in the cell death of that stria. Rebellion induced hearing loss might not actually occur until after birth, but in developing countries or countries without the better vaccination programs, it can actually become a fairly leading environmental cause of congenital um, hearing loss. Just a brief mention of toxoplasmosis. Um, we find that this is only really prevalent in um, areas where there's lack of hygiene prevention strategies. And then I don't know if anyone remembers, but um, a couple of years ago, there was quite a big outbreak of Zika virus in Brazil. So in Brazil, they had a look at about 70 infants up until about nine to 10 months with microcephaly, and up to 7% of these kids actually had sensory neural hearing loss. So let's have a look, little look at the diagnosis and prevention. So thinking of all these causes or common causes in mind, what are we to do now? Well, ideally how this should go is after the neonatal hearing screening is performed, um, the child should be flagged and there should be referral for formal audiometric assessment. Formal audiometric assessment will confirm the presence A, of hearing loss. It will classify it as how severe it is and it will classify the laterality, in other words, whether it's unilateral or bilateral. The severity um, of hearing loss, um, the, st the standard is sort of to look at the average over the speech frequencies, and it's classified into mild, moderate, severe, and profound, and it's applied to a better hearing ear. Mm -hmm. Now, the ear is then, so once you've done your audiometric assessment, the, hear the ear will then be, often will be assessed by different kinds of tests to cross-check your results. 
So this might be a combination of optoacoustic emissions, auditory brainstem responses, or behavioral audiometry. So as you can see, once the neonatal screening has been done, there needs to be a formal audiometric assessment. And then after that, sometimes you might have different tests just to make sure that your results are in fact correct um, and accurate. So there are some guidelines with regards to bilateral congenital hearing loss. The suggested guidelines in the literature are, if a patient has bilateral congenital hearing loss, that we should be doing genetic testing. And this is usually limited to the two genes that we described before. These are considered your first line genetic tests. The second point and guideline is that we should be screening for congenital infections and you might consider imaging. So it's really those three cornerstones, but also these children should have ophthalmological screening to look for ocular signs of infections, a kidney ultrasound, and an ECG. Any other test would be based on your clinical findings. So in essence, if you were going to do a workup and you're searching for a cause and your patient had bilateral con um, congenital hearing loss and you had access to genetic testing, certainly genetic testing would be something you would start with, <clears throat> as well as for screening for congenital infections and even some imaging. There are some guidelines for unilateral congenital hearing loss. This is a lot more brief. And the guidelines suggest that you do only a thorough clinical examination for syndromic cause. You will investigate for possible congenital infections, and then you might consider doing imaging of the inner ear. What's good to note, or what is to just to be taken note of, is that the guidelines don't include next generation DNA sequencing or genetic testing panels. But if we look at the literature, Genetic testing panels have completely changed our diagnostic algorithm, even though it's not widely available. So in the future and going forward, the need for other investigations other than genetic testing um, panels is likely to be guided by the results of genetic testing and the suspected diagnosis. But until then, we'll follow our suggested algorithm. If we follow our suggested algorithm, the literature quotes that an etiological factor might be identified in about half of your patients. So that's the algorithm that excludes the genetic testing panels. So if our guidelines don't include next generation DNA sequencing, but they have changed the diagnostic algorithm, and we continue with our suggested workup, but if we do all of the above and we only identify an etiological factor in about 50% of patients, should we be going through all the effort? So should we start the search if our etiological factor can only be identified about 50% of our patients in context of our resources, time, transport of patients to hospital, etc.? Well, the literature suggests that there are good reasons for doing the workup. The reasons that the literature gives are that it gives caregivers an answer as to a cause and it helps them with guilt relief. It helps to improve the accuracy of genetic counseling, it aids in management, and it can also predict hearing loss progression. If we combine it with the genetic diagnosis, it helps with risk stratification um, for hearing loss for other children, future children in the family, and thus the family plan. If we use um, therapeutic, it also guides our use of therapeutic options such as hearing aids, um, special schooling, and proper implantation might identify other medical problems that need attention, and it might help you to counsel your family um, on avoiding the risks that might affect hearing negatively going forward. For example, which children with um, congenital hearing loss should not have any right signs. So I suppose in the literature, there are some valid reasons for doing a workup, um, but I think it needs to be taken in the context of what resources you have available at your, at your institution. If we continue a little bit on um, genetic diagnostics, um, what they suggest is the first place to start is to get a great family history, and that will help you to determine a probable mode of inheritance. If there's no positive family history, you would consider that perhaps this is an autosomal recessive gene inheritance pattern, or this is environmental causes. So that I found quite useful because that's something you can implement in the clinic immediately on the first visit that the patient um, has with you just by obtaining a simple history. If we're thinking about something like non-syndromic hearing loss, 
and you have availability of DNA testing, just note that even with DNA testing, this could be quite tricky because you can have lots of positive genes causing um, non-syndromic hearing loss, as we mentioned before. And in your non-syndromic populations, very few have phenotypical clues. In other words, these children have no clinical signs because they have non-syndromic hearing loss. Other than the hearing loss, they, you know, they don't have any other phenotypical features of a syndrome. Also, with genetic diagnostics, this is costly. Um, in the literature now and in first world countries, they have considered starting to do large genetic testing panels, which has made it more affordable. However, it's still costly. Um, these large genetic panels have the highest diagnostic rate of any test once the audiometry confirms. So even though it is expensive, it's not really available, the genetic panels do have a very high rate of diagnostic value. <clears throat> so what would the cost of genetic testing be? Well, let's take you back to North America, where money is maybe not so much an option. And if you were in this financially well of country, what would you do? Well, you do, if you compare a complete workup with a diagnostic test, so in other words, you did labs, you did bloods, and you did imaging, all of that would actually be quite costly versus if you were in North America and you had comprehensive panel of genetic testing, in relation to doing the complete workup, this would actually be less expensive. It's also said to be less expensive than temporal bone imaging. Doing um, genetic testing has the highest single test positive diagnostic rate in the evaluation of non-syndromic hearing loss. So lucky for countries that are um, financially well off, and certainly if we were in one of those countries, perhaps this would be a much better test to do um, that would cost us less than ever to be However, it would probably still be unaffordable for a country like ours, a third world country like ours. However, even with this testing, in North America, you would still need the panel at the bottom. You would still need a multidisciplinary team of experts to interpret a very large amount of genetic variance. And they would have to combine this with their phenotypical data. So even in facilities with access to genetic testing, you have to be able to integrate hearing loss phenotype and genotype. And this can be quite challenging. And there are some, um, some systems that are, putting, that are being put in place to try and progress um, this integration of information. So if we just come one step back, this is maybe more applicable in our context, but there are some specific tests that you can do if you're looking for acquired causes. As I mentioned, we won't go into all of them, but if you were looking for cytomegalovirus, and your consideration would be any newborn that has signs of cytomegalovirus, you would test them because it's the leading non-genetic cause of congenital hearing loss. The signs that you would pick up on a kidney would be intranutrient growth, retardation, microcephaly, and jaundice. You could also consider in newborn hearing in newborns with um, hearing loss that are otherwise healthy. As we mentioned, around 90% of children infected with cytomegalovirus will be completely asymptomatic. How would you test them? You can test, you can do testing prenatally by looking at amniotic fluid, PCR, however, that's fairly invasive, or you could test them post-birth. If you're going to test them post-birth, you have to test them within three weeks. Um, you can do this simply by collecting saliva or urine. If you're going to test them after three weeks, you have to consider that this might be acquired rather than a congenital cytomegalovirus. So you would consider some lab tests. Other things you might want to do is an uh, ultrasound, a cerebral ultrasound, or if you have an MRI available, and certainly a visual assessment. 90% of newborns, as we mentioned, that have a cytomegalovirus infection are asymptomatic. These asymptomatic group of patients will have fewer developmental problems than the symptomatic patient going forward, but at least 10% will have sensory neural hearing loss at some time during their course of childhood. If we look at rubella, rubella is fairly rare in the developed world, but it is still endemic in some low-income countries. Children infected with rubella can be infectious for many months. Rubella has been found to survive in cataracts for up to three years. What lab tests can you do? Well, often it's a bit of a triage, it's a bit of a triage of information. Um, there might be thrombocytopenia, hyperbilirubinemia, and leukopenia. You would consider that there's unexplained hearing loss if you can't exclude it on history. 
So how are we going to manage these little kitties um, in terms of surgical and some non-surgical options? If we were looking at management of the infectious acquired causes, this would obviously lead you to more non-surgical approaches. And the aim really is to reduce damage to the cochlea. In cytomegalovirus, you would, any child with clinical manifestations of cytomegalovirus and cranial nerve involvement, you want to give them antiviral treatment. Traditionally, the treatment suggested was gancyclovir for six weeks, either or oral. But more recently, and there's a prodrug called valgancyclovir, which should be given for six months, starting in the first month of life. And this prodrug has actually proved to have much better neurodevelopmental outcomes, even though you would have to give it for a longer period of time. They are working on some vaccination or immunoglobulin therapy for cytomegalovirus. In your infected children, you want to follow them up with multiple hearing tests, even if their hearing at birth is normal. They are at risk for progressive hearing loss at a later stage. If we look at rubella and some other viruses, well, rubella, we know that there is a vaccination available, which is in trivalent or quadrivalent form. So this is usually given around a year with a boost at around four to five years. With, toxic, with um, a toxoplasmosis um, infection, there's a lot more limited data and support. And for um, trypanema pallidum, that might be the other um, infectious acquired cause that you might want to treat. With Zika virus, well, with Zika virus, really the non-surgical management of the patient, although there's no specific medication um, advocated, you might want to do newborn screening, an ABR, and repeat, um, repeat the ABR four to six months. Um, another consideration is restoration of hearing. So these are the children that we know have hearing loss and we need to be able to offer them and the family something um, to be able to, to encourage their development. And when we look at that, we can look at some implantable surgical or non-implantable devices. These might include hearing aids, um, but the maximum gain of hearing aids is as demonstrated in the slide. Um, if it's in the ear, you can gain about probably about 65 decibels. If it's in the canal, a little bit less, 55. And if it's completely in the canal, also around 50. But hearing aids are digital, they're programmable, they can be customized to your patient. They have some limitations. They are expensive if, you, if the patient needs to purchase them themselves. Um, they have to be happy with the cosmetic aspect of wearing the hearing aids, and they can include your external auditory canal intimately. Cochlear implants um, has now become the gold standard of care in profound congenital hearing loss. Often, um, we used to look at severe, only severe profound hearing loss patients. If we look at, even if we do unilateral implants, it will improve the hearing and quality of life scores for these patients. And with bilateral implants, you even have improved sound location and it improves the patient's ability to hear in noisy environments. So, whereas before it only used to be severe to profound hearing loss patients for cochlear implants, we now know that patients that have relatively good low frequency hearing, but poor high frequency hearing, are also candidates for cochlear implants and they also do well. And at what age? Well, now these patients can now be in, um, implanted typically before their first birthday. Another option would be a bone anchored hearing aid. And these we would consider in children with congenital abnormalities. For example, these are kids that have the bony atresia of the external auditory canal. In other words, you can't augment them with the traditional hearing aid, um, and perhaps you need to bypass that whole external and middle ear system. It has got its own complications. The most notorious one is non osseous integration. In summary, congenital hearing loss is very prevalent as a childhood chronic condition. We want to be able to prevent long-term problems with speech and language and development. And this will help children in terms of their quality of life, the emotional effects, social and financial aspects. In low-income settings, your causes might be environmental or prenatal. In uh, more developed countries, mostly it's due to genetic factors. Under, identifying the underlying cause helps direct us with some decision-making. And there are management options, for example, hearing restoration, um, as we've mentioned before. We need to be aware of genetic testing developments. Even if you can't implement it in your own country or your own institution at the moment, it is good to know what's happening internationally 
and what the developments are and what we should be aware of if we, we are going to be able to give our patient the best options going forward. These genetic testing uh, developments will probably change screening options and might open the door to new treatments. Challenges, well, challenges in our federal context is that we need to get better at prevention at preventing our infective etiologies because they are our biggest risk factors. We need to be able to moderate, we need to be able to moderate the effects of genetic hearing loss by picking kids up early, identifying them early, intervening early, and offering them um, options for restoration of hearing. Your multidisciplinary disciplinary team has an invaluable um, tool for the management of these children. And as we mentioned, neonatal hearing and screening is going to able, enable early intervention and something that all institutions should look at implementing um, because long term it will be cost effective, even though to jump start it might take a fair amount of um, finances as well as um, input, team input. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if there are any questions or comments. Um, Tashneem Harris, uh, Dr. Harris, would you like to comment? Thanks, Louisa. That was a very nice presentation. I think your last sentence was basically summarized nicely that early uh, neonatal screening allows early intervention. And I think um, one of the one of the major issues around universal screening when one looks at sort of why it hasn't taken off in um, develop, developing countries is the cost, it's laborious, patients don't follow up, you know, if you identify a, a child who's, who's not passed the test, uh, parents don't understand the importance of coming back. And so all that work you've done has been for naught almost because of the poor follow up. Or, and that, that poor follow up may be from different reasons, it may be uh, parent education, it may be problems of access, it may be, you know, they really are multifactorial if you're looking in a developing world setting. Um, there was a very nice paper by Prof, uh, by Lucretia Peterson and Prof Swanepoel that looked at um, sort of screening as part of the immunization program as a means of overcoming that because ultimately, while most most children, most parents will take their children back for the immunizations and kind of using that as a is it a more cost effective way of screening and and one might ask well and i think this is the other thing and this is perhaps the problem is that um people feel well why screen if there's nothing you can do about it cochlear implants are expensive and they are expensive but you don't only want to screen because you want to be able to put a cochlear implant in as you correctly said that child needs to be identified. It may be that they need hearing aids, um, but it also allows you to, so it allows that child to access education that is going to be appropriate for that child, to allow the appropriate development, even in the absence of implants. Whether that's signing or whether that's just a hearing aid, that still needs to happen. And I think the biggest problem is this mindset that we can't afford cochlear implants, so there's really no point in screening children and, and I think that is the biggest problem that's probably been the biggest the cost of implants has probably been the biggest hindrance towards implementing universal screening because it's always been seen as that and I think that needs to change it takes a long time to change something like that and if you look at the, the northern countries in Africa they have spent and the only reason they now have universal screening is because they have been people who have been advocating this for years, sometimes for a decade, and constantly advocating it, and that's what we need. Um, and that's why it hasn't taken off here, because no one is advocating for it. Um, or, or, or we are, but sort of very intermittently or erratically, but not consistently. And so it's not being seen as kind of that important. Um, but it is quite important because obviously there are a lot of children. And the sad, sad thing is a lot of the a lot, a lot of those other uh, the causes of congenital hearing loss that you've mentioned, particularly in developing worlds, are actually preventable causes. And, and this is the other thing is that, you know, as people's awareness improves, 
obviously the health um the health dialogue changes mm -hmm. and, and people become more aware and, and realize that there are treatments that they understand the effects of you know whatever infection on their child's future development so you know i i think as as um, we need to change the dialogue around universal screening away from cochlear implants in a way to be able to start it because if we look at the cost we're never going to do it yeah thanks thanks so much dr harris um Silva, your hand is raised um do you want to just unmute your microphone um and you can make a comment hi louisa sorry I, are you able to hear me yes we can hear you loud and clear Thanks. Thanks for a lovely presentation, Louisa. Um, I just have a couple of comments uh, to make. Um, the first one is in, in regard to newborn hearing screening. Um, you mentioned that OAE and AABR are typically used. And I just wanted to comment that, um, especially for high risk patients, such as those who are born extremely prematurely or who have um, neonatal jaundice, severe neonatal jaundice requiring exchange transfusion, um, for those children, often if you only screen with an OAE, um, their OAEs pass because they have um, they have normal cochlear function, um, but the lesion often for these children with um, uh, ex, ex prematurity or um, neonatal jaundice, um, the site of lesion is is the auditory nerve, um, which results in auditory neuropathy, and you're only going to pick that up with an AABR. Um, so so. Uh, you know, I'm always an advocate. If you are going to start a newborn hearing screening project, um, leave the OAE and just, if feasible and if viable, um, go with the AABR because you are going to miss those children who have risk factors for neuropathy. And then um, I just wanted to um, also highlight this premise that we are shifting towards a um, uh, this premise of task shifting in neonatal newborn, uh, neonatal <laughs> newborn hearing screening. Um, we don't have the, the resources um, in South Africa and in many sub-Saharan African countries for audiologists to conduct screening. And so um, this premise of task shifting is very important um, because we need to train nurses and, and you know, community rehabilitation workers to take the screening equipment and to go and conduct screening in the community um, which is the only way that we're going to reach vulnerable um, vulnerable populations, especially those children also who are not born in a hospital. Um, so it's just, I just wanted to highlight that. And then um, there they are definitely unique risk factors in sub-Saharan Africa that are more prevalent than in developed countries. Um, so last year, um, I also published a, a study with Prof Swanepoel um, about, about the unique risk factors in, in the Western Cape population. And just some of those that came out were, were neonatal jaundice, very high prevalence. Um, I know, you know, this is not necessarily congenital hearing loss, but it, it's definitely early onset hearing loss if you have um, severe neonatal jaundice, which is so prevalent. And then also the, the congenital CMV and the rubella that are still so rife in our country, um, generally due to the lack of vaccination um, programs that are available in the state sector. So I just wanted to make those few comments. Thanks so much, Silva. I really appreciate the input. Um, there's a question for the roles of the next 26 and 13 genetic screening of congenital hearing loss. I think the two genes we, we mentioned actually code for connexin 26 and 13. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. And then there's another comment that says, how far do we search for cause in regards to cost in practice? Is there a list of questions to ask during history taking? Most of our lower end medical aids does not reimburse for hearing aids. Um, yeah, so um, so just in terms of searching for cause, I think with congenital hearing loss, the practice has always been to send the patient for genetic testing to the geneticist. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a child with congenital hearing loss, then um, you know one would other than the the, the, the bloods like CMB because those are things that you can test for, right? Mm -hmm. And the other things would be the. What if those tests are negative, then actually sending them to the geneticist for, um, for, genetic, for uh, genetic screening and they then decide what would be the most appropriate. I don't think the geneticists, I stand corrected, I don't think that the full battery of 
of tests for the genetic non syndromic, but they certainly do the common ones. So I'm not sure if the medical aids would cover that um, in terms of tests, but you're, you're absolutely right. It, it becomes a very expensive exercise, especially if the medical aids don't cover it. Um, and I think just in terms of medical aids, not reimbursing for hearing aids. I mean, I think, you know, particularly in children, that's another thing that needs to change because these children desperately need hearing aids and uh, without it, obviously the hearing development is really um, not optimized. So, you know, I think that's pretty much something that needs to happen with the, that needs to happen between the ENTs and the audiologists and the, and, and the uh, medical aids really, that, you know, it's no longer something that they cannot just reimburse, particularly in children. So I would very much strong, uh, strongly try and motivate, particularly in, in children, for them to actually cover the cost. Um, also, you asked, is there a list of questions to ask during history taping? Um, I can't say that I've encountered a list of uh, questions other than just reading in the literature, the general sort of things you ask, but maybe that's some food for thought, maybe that's something we could work on, have a look at the literature and see uh, which questions would be useful in a resource constraint um, environment, so that's a good suggestion. Um, and then Silva just made a comment and said, also just for interest, the global annual cost of hearing loss in the education sector is 27 billion US dollars. Um, so, massive. There's just a comment on the floor, yeah. Charles. Just to add on that uh, first question. So, the, the connection um, 26 is quoted by the GJB2, which is the most common uh, implicated in the so that's the alternative to screening. So that's the first gene that they screen for. And then the second most common is the GJD2 that's caused for the connection data. So that's sort of like the alternative in terms of the order of the of the genetic tests because they are quite expensive. Thanks so much, Charles. Appreciate it. Um, are there any other comments or um, sort of questions from the floor? Okay, I don't see any more in the chat function. Um, thank you everyone for joining uh, this morning. I uh, hope we answered some of the questions. I'm sure there'll be a lot more. Uh, it's quite an extensive topic with lots of um, factors. If anyone has some bright ideas of what we can do immediately in our own countries, um, that you know doesn't push for expensive genetic testing at the moment. Uh, definitely bring it up. Uh, with that, I'm going to start any meeting. Uh, have a good weekend, and please remember that Friday is a public holiday in South, in South Africa. So there'll be no meeting on Friday. We will join you again next week. Thanks very much.